sitting behind the bridge. Uh, in 2008, last uh, September, uh, Tate Britton and Chelsea College of Art commissioned me to do another work with Big Ben. And uh, this uh, was done very differently than the first one. It was a sound map of how the bells of Big Ben traveled through central London. So just listen to this a minute. So all those uh, delays you're hearing are generated by the distances of various buildings uh, around Big Ben. And you're hearing uh, one of the microphone positions which is where the changing of the guard takes place. Uh, uh, and you just, so, so you also hear the chime of the horse guard's clock in this. Okay, uh, now that'll take us to uh, the current project. This is you making recordings, I believe? Right. The uh, current the project here um, at the John Street Bridge is divided into, uh, into three zones. I was interested in uh, the natural history of the San Antonio River and trying to evoke acoustically a, uh, a sense of, of what, that, what that was and the sort of timelessness that, the, uh, that, that to me, a river, uh, a river has. Um, I made three, two trips to San Antonio where, where I did some extensive sound recording, but it really ended up uh, primarily using uh, recordings on my last recording trip near Victoria, Texas, uh, at, a, at a property near the convergence of the San Antonio and Guadalupe rivers. Uh, and do you want to show? Um, yeah. Oh, well, wrong way. Okay. Oh, here's the. Oh, uh, these are the uh, speakers being uh, installed uh, under the bridge, which is in three zones. There's four loudspeakers under the bridge uh, above the water. There's eight speakers in the pathway uh, that you walk under the bridge. And then there's four speakers on that sort of ramp that approaches the, uh, the bridge. So there's three zones, uh, one four-channel zone on, above the water, an eight-channel zone on the path under the bridge, and a four-channel zone along the side of the river. This is the four-channel zone. And that's a bicycle that was uh, recorded on a footbridge at Posada Dam. Is that what it's called? It's spotted. It's spotted. Oh, sorry. Go to the next one. This is the footpath. Do we have sound? Yeah, it's coming. And there's eight speakers under here, and what you hear is largely based on this wonderful dawn recording from uh, Victoria, Texas. A dawn recording. Okay. And um, in a way, my favorite part is actually the sounds that happen under here. And I did something here that I normally never do because I'm noted for really not manipulating sound, but I decided to have some fun with this. And I took the recordings of, uh, from Victoria, Texas, and uh, in my studio, did two things with them. I uh, spatialized them a bit so that there's some movement and t time delay, but I also slow altered the pitch uh, several times and, and also, also altered the timing of these different harmonic layers of the sound and mix them together so you sort of turn that dawn recording into this uh, uh, sound environment that is a mixture of being underwater and maybe in the Amazon or has some very uh, sort of, uh, to me, very interesting qualities as you, you know, pass under that bridge. I wanted you to enter another world. But one thing I wanted to say about doing the sound work uh, along the river is the, the bridges are transitory spaces. You know, people are walking under them. There's on boats going past them. And I wanted people to stop. I wanted to get people to somehow stop and listen and contemplate the visual surroundings of the bridge of this, this museum, which you can uh, see very well from there. And to, you know, try to alter people's perception of time. You know, if you're walking somewhere, you know, you're idea is that you're, you're getting somewhere and you're not stopping and, and and there's and I wanted to get people to somehow stop and listen I wanted to use sound as a way 
to interrupt the journey and get people to sort of uh, t relate to the environment and landscape in a different way. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Carlos Cortez is a San Antonio native, third generation, faux bois, concrete artisan. His great uncle, highly regarded artist uh, Dionisio Rodriguez, uh, brought the sculptural form to Texas from Mexico City and passed his knowledge to Carlos's father, Maximo, who in turn apprenticed Carlos in the art. Um, now we're going to see, I think, an earlier project and learn about the current one. Welcome, Carlos. Uh, this is at the Landa Memorial Library here in San Antonio. Uh, yes, this is a palapa, probably the largest one that I've ever done uh, to this point. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many trees we built there. I want to say maybe six or seven. Uh, there's a, some benches. There's quite a bit of work to the, the floor, too. How long did it take you to uh, put that together? This project took me quite a bit of time. It was from beginning to end about a year, but that was because I only had two assistants. And at one point, one of the assistants broke his arm. So we were, and we took a, a, a about a three month, um, it was a, a time there where we were off of the project for about three months and there was a rainy season. This was last summer when we had quite a bit of rain. I think here we have another view. Now what are we looking at? Okay, this is um, uh, artist rendering of the grotto. The, the one that taken you from just the completed. Model. Yes, the one that we just completed. And um, again, it's an artist rendering from the model that we created, Fort Paul and Carson, myself. And um, it's hopefully after the grotto itself, the landscaping takes over, it'll look somewhat similar to this. Now it doesn't look exactly the same. I'm not sure what we're looking at there. I guess another uh, artist rendering, maybe the first sketches that uh, he did. And this is based, this is a palapa. This is what we're more uh, known for, the tree form, the uh, shaded structure. And this, was, this sketch was done off of a sketch that I did on, I want to say it was a napkin, something like that. Mm. And I, mm. I that's where that you got your best ideas, right? Yeah, I sketched it. I mean, it's it's all based. It's all been done before. My my family's been doing this for generations, and but I've always wanted to do that uh, the big, huge tree that supports that canopy in a twisted form, uh, kind of looking like a hand holding up the 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 root. And uh, so the artist um, that was hired by Fort Palm Carson uh, drew that up. But it was basically straight from a a sketch that I had done. Same napkin, uh, different napkin. Well, that's again, <laughs> that's the artist, that's the, 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 the hired artist. Body. Right, but based on your napkin. Based on, on, the, on the model. There is going to be a model at the AIA um, okay. offices. That, that's the one that we worked on. It's all, that drawing is based on the model that we did. Okay, and here we are now under construction. Yes, now there's quite a bit of difference between the concept and what we're actually building. And tell us a little bit about the process. Well, the process, um, there was quite a bit of, well, we did, the majority of the work was done between, say, the middle of January to right now. And we are still, um, there are still some things that are, that there's a punch list of things to do, but um, yards and yards of concrete, over probably a thousand yards. Don't quote me on that, but I, I guess it's, from what I've understood, it could be close to that or over that amount. A lot of steel, it's, it's construction, it's, it's um, reinforced concrete. So there's quite a bit of steel there and there's a foundation underneath there that, um, you know, that's to support that structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, um, let's see, that's me working on, we have a space there that I guess on the right hand side, that is the waterfall. And we needed that, that space to go above the, the ceiling. So what I did is I created a planter above there, the tree form planter you see me working on to kind of hide that, that space. 
And I think actually this is all we have on the way of photos at the moment. Oh, that's it? Yeah, oh, okay. let me double check. No, that's it. Okay. But um, people certainly can go outside and experience it in real life, yes. and we encourage you to do that. Thank, Thank you, Carlos. Donald Lipsky first came to national attention 30 years ago with an amazing installation called Gathering Dust, where he took tiny little objects. Most of his life, he's been collecting things like rubber bands and matchbooks and so on and making little objects, and he had them stored in, a cigar, in cigar boxes. Well, his first installation that earned him national recognition was an installation of pinning all these little objects that he made, all the little doodads like butterflies, to, to the wall. And from that point, he's just been going great guns, and his materials have gotten larger and larger because now he's pinning fish to the underside of an underpass. But um, I also have to um, say that I met Donald 20 years ago when um, I approached him about curating a retrospective of his work, and so I'm delighted to welcome back into my life today here in San Antonio, Donald Lipsky. Thank you. We're just going to focus on, on his public art, but you can see one of his earlier sculptures just on the other side of this wall in the permanent collection of Sammer. Uh, it, it sort of blows my mind that I had a retrospective 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> you know, that, that's good. Um, this, this is not a piece of Carlos's. This is mine. Uh, but it's also an artificial tree. It's at uh, Grand Central Terminal in New York. They did a a major renovation of the whole place, which had become rather dingy uh, in the 90s. And uh, they made a new entrance on Lexington Avenue at 43rd Street that leads into the Grand Central Market. And I, I made this piece. It was inspired by two things. One, the uh, fantastic chandeliers that they have throughout Grand Central. And two, uh, the I wanted to refer in some way to the uh, mural of uh, the night sky with the constellations in it, the, the star ceiling in the main concourse there. So uh, th my fabricator was a woman named Jonquil Lemaster, uh, who's up in Oregon, who is uh, just a fantastic craftsperson and also an artist in her own right. Um, and it's an upside down olive tree uh, with thousands of chandelier crystals hanging from it. it this is at the Washington, D.C. Convention Center. Um, I'm trying to think what to say about it. It's well, quick uh, and nice. Oh, the, the when, I was, when I was a kid, uh, my father was in the bicycle business, and so going to a uh, convention center... Uh, meant going to the bike show, the toy show, the sporting goods show, stuff like that. So I just, pile. excuse me? Ram pile. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> More toys. <laughs> More toys. Um, so to me, the a convention center was uh, an object of, uh, a place of joy. So I put in uh, what are for me joy objects. Uh, there's uh, sculptures made out of, uh, Guitars, kayaks, tennis rackets, uh, bicycles, and bar stools. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, some of you may have seen this. It's at the Fort Worth Convention Center. Uh, it hangs in a big atrium space, and it's made out of uh, cowboy hats. There's about, I think, about 400, 500 cowboy hats, and they were given for the project by uh, the citizens of Fort Worth and, and beyond. There's uh, uh, George Bush Sr. gave a hat, and uh, your governor gave a hat, and uh, country western stars and cowboy stars and people in the streets and so forth. There's a, a hat that saved a guy's life because he collected rainwater when he fell off his horse, and so on. Uh, if you get to Fort Worth, go see it. This is uh, uh, at a children's hospital in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, let's see, what the, is there another picture of that? Nope. No. Okay, it, it's a big atrium space, and it uh, goes sort of swooping up 
to the roof, um, which is uh, six stories tall. <clears throat> and there's a curtain wall that faces south. So I, I built this structure and hung about 1,000 pounds of crystals on it. The idea was to give something that would just be totally uh, delightful and distracting to the kids when they're coming into this new hospital. It's a beautiful place, but it's intimidating to walk into. Uh, and one of the challenges was that they deal with kids from neonatal to uh, 18 years old. So it had to be very engaging at the same time, have the level of sophistication that a, an, uh, a teenager wouldn't find it childish. This is, uh, let, 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 me see, let me see all the pictures. Yeah, let's start here and then okay. we'll go back to there. Okay. Uh, my thoughts about this space, when I saw the space, I could see how uh, being under a highway, under, uh, unlike the other bridges which are sort of uh, picturesque, walking under this space was sort of dark and forbidding and there was a thought that maybe people would be on the river walk and they'd walk up to a certain point and then turn around and go back. So I, I myself didn't see the space as uh, foreboding in any sense. To me, it's like a cathedral. It's a, a, a soaring, dramatic, beautiful space. I wanted to draw people in there. I wanted to draw their eyes up. Uh, and I, I wanted uh, it just uh, to be uh, something that would be delightful. Uh, and so I think that that space has really, with the addition of these fish, uh, transmuted from being something potentially uh, dreary and dark into uh, a, a really magnificent uh, public space. Uh, one of, the, one of the challenges was I had to place the fish before we got down here because the electrician had to put in uh, the wiring. Um, and again, Mike Adkinson uh, made a SketchUp model for me. SketchUp is a, a 3D program that you can get free from Google <laughs> and learn how to use in about 15 minutes. Um, and so I was able to... Uh, use this tool to move through the space and uh, figure out where the fish would go so it would look great from all the different vantage points. Uh, these, these are the fish. Uh, my original idea was to have goldfish uh, and then I became aware of a local fish that's really beautiful that's called a uh, long-eared sunfish. Uh, they grow to about this big. Uh, they're, they're, they're great because you can catch it with a, a hook and a worm. So when kids are first learning to fish, this is something that they're very likely uh, to catch. The, the fish were fabricated uh, for me by a man named Mike Kirkhart that I don't know if he's here. Are you here, Mike? Uh, He's, he's down, he came down for the celebration, so he's in town and maybe you'll run across him. Uh, Mike Kirkhart is a taxidermist in Stewart, Florida. He started doing taxidermy when he was eight years old, uh, and he's three times won uh, the title best taxidermist in the world. And you go out there and you'll, you'll look at uh, the, just the sheer beauty of the fish he's created. Uh, he's really a master. I had worked with him on another uh, installation maybe about uh, eight or ten years ago at the Miami airport. That if you're there, it's uh, in Terminal D. It was at that time a new international arrivals terminal. Uh, and I've, I've been thinking that I would love to work with him again, and this uh, gave me an opportunity. Uh, and so he uh, sculpted the fish. You see, uh, there is a picture of me uh, uh, 
pretending to do manual labor, you know. <laughs> I guess we're, we're all on that boat, you know, to some extent. Uh, but really, Mike built this. I made uh, several trips down to Florida, and we worked back and forth. Uh, did a lot of experimentation in terms of figuring out the lighting, which uh, if, if any of you uh, get the chance, do try to see it at night because uh, it's, it's really, it, it comes to life in a wonderful way. And uh, Carlos's uh, Palapa is a great place to, to watch it from. Uh, this is during the installation. Uh, on your left, you can see uh, the translucency uh, of the material. It's not actually fiberglass uh, because we wanted something that had more transparency. It is a, a cast plastic that was laid up in a mold. Um, and they're about seven feet long. And this is during the installation. And this is what it looks and like now. This, this <laughs> is what it looks like now down in the uh, bottom left. At night. And at night. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, let me just say one more thing. The whole river walk thing and this museum reach extension is just such a magnificent thing and it was all uh, so beautifully done uh, in every way and it's going to be great to watch the city grow up around it, watch the plantings come in and uh, I'm just so pleased to be a part of it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. San Antonio artist George Schrader works with metal, has transformed solid steel into fluid lines with the light touch of a fine painter. I'm not sure who wrote that, but it's a nice description. Uh, he's done several commission works around San Antonio, and we're going to look at some of them now. Oh, okay. Um, this piece is on the uh, San Antonio River. So this uh, this is kind of this this new commission for the bridge is, is my second visit uh, for a site specific type of situation, and the challenge on this project was um, the uh, San Antonio has these incredible artesian wells all over the city. In this particular area, there's it's one of the largest ones, and they have these giant pumping systems that are pretty ugly that are sitting right on the river. And uh, so the design enhancement program of the city approached me and uh, wanted to talk about some sort of enclosure that was interesting and sculptural and had something to do with the river. So um, what you see here is a fabricated steel sort of sculptural enclosure screens, I guess you could call them. And there's, there's an obvious inspiration there from, for river forms. You can see the kind of undulating lines throughout the panels and uh, up on top of the, the structure. Um, so that's, that's that one. Um, this is another project in San Antonio that uh, was ch also you know, another you know, kind of challenge that I was a little bit intimidated by because the sculpture had to hang off the building. So when they approached me to, to uh, kind of you know, conceptualize and think, think about the project, um, I didn't want to do something on the building. I wanted to do something in front of the building. Um, but then we finally came back around and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to hang this thing on the building. And luckily the building is solid concrete walls. So that was a relief once the engineer came by and told me about that. Um, and the forms are, the other kind of quirky thing about this project is that the company is called, you can see right there, it's called the American Payroll Association. And they kept asking me to do something that was kind of about, you know, the flowy form of, of money, you know, the dollar bill. <laughs> and so I, I wasn't real excited about that either, uh, to tell you the truth, because it's, it, it was becoming more of a kind of board of director kind of situation about this, about this sculpture. So anyways, I, I, I had some fun with it, and it ended up being a, a great project. And uh, the title of it was Paychecks from Heaven, which is kind of <laughs> goofy, but you know, I had to, I got to pay the bills, you know. So, um, this 
particular uh, exhibit was here in San Antonio at the, at the Blue Star Contemporary Art Center. And they asked me to fill this, uh, one of their exhibit rooms with, you know, you know, with sculpture or an installation. And at the time, I didn't have any new work, and I was a little bit frustrated with, you know, kind of where I was moving in a direction uh, with form and, and, you know, and materials. And so it was, a, it was a long kind of mental battle before I actually made these pieces. And I had about a year to make the pieces, and the show was in uh, January. And I got started on them in uh, probably about, like, November. And they came out, uh, it was kind of this compulsive uh, explosion of ideas that, uh, that I, I just couldn't stop, obviously, looking at this picture. There's, this is about half of them. And what they are are these, uh, these forms that I had seen kind of floating around the metal scrapyard, because that's, that's kind of where I hang out, where you know, people go get coffee, I go to the scrapyard. So, uh, and I'd come across these forms that in their, in their singular kind of presence, they weren't that interesting. They're just, you know, chunks of metal kind of sitting around. And then I started to kind of gather them, uh, you know, just out of curiosity and whatnot. And then I started to make these assemblages, these real small ones, maybe, you know, the size of, you know, two foot by two foot. And they, be, they became larger and larger. And then they really started to take on their own life. And the, the, in, in, the, in the early beginnings of my kind of sculptural you know, exploration and uh, training and whatnot that I, I was, I, I become real obsessed with in the beginning about finding steel and then making it my own thing, either where it's, whether it's cutting it or, or bending it or, or getting it in different shapes through just pure force and uh, adding heat. But the, the liberation on this series was that the pieces were already sort of presented to me and, uh, and I kind of made this collage and this, of these of these sculptural forms, and I was kind of you know throughout the series of making these, I didn't really, I didn't really stop and think about what what it was going to be called or, or you know this heavy conceptual, because um, I don't really work like that. I don't I don't start with real heavy, you know kind of cerebral ideas. I just I, I pretty much work on the fly. So when I was done with them, I thought you know I've there was some sort of redeeming value to these pieces and that they, they became these noble, raw expressions of, of materials that have been just discarded. And uh, that's why I, I titled it Redemption Series. The, uh, the piece uh, with the, the arcs, the spirits piece, was commissioned for a library here in San Antonio and it was a site-specific challenge. Um, and they approached me about the, uh, the piece kind of laid on into the project. Um, so that was another, you know, normally with these site-specific situations, it's, it's a time constraint, and that's a whole other story. But anyways, the, uh, the park, it's a, the park is the Comanche Lookout Park, and it's a, the park has um, got a real high lookout point that supposedly the, you know, the Comanche Indians had a part of this area, and there's a, there's a native Indian element in this part of San Antonio at, at this park. So I kind of drew inspiration from native Indian uh, sort of, you know, their indigenous thinking is, a lot, there's a lot of spiritual and animal spiritual, uh, you know, iconic images that they use in their, in their own native, in their, in their native Indian thinking about, you know, spiritual forms and movement. But when I, I wanted to make these abstractions of kind of a, a soaring kind of movement towards the sky as sort of a, a homage to the, to the native Indian spirit. And the, the piece on the right is another, is another close-up piece of the Redemption series. And this is the, uh, the River Bridge project. Um, the sketches you see are, are two different bridges, the Camden Street Bridge and the Newell Street Bridge. And they're, they're framing up Carlos's uh, grotto. So I knew I was going to be in, when I, when I found out I was going to be in that area, I was, I was excited because of Carlos's, uh, his, his forms and my kind of forms complement each other. And when I thought about the river and the, uh, what I was going to do for these bridges, I immediately thought of organic forms, uh, river forms that are abstracted into my own 
uh, kind of vocabulary, which is steel, and and this is what I came up with. The uh, the Newell Street Bridge is a uh, an existing railing that is in pretty bad shape, and I have to retrofit my kind of sculptural panels into this railing, um, and that's been one of the challenges. Uh, for the project, for the timeline, is you know, obviously it's not hasn't been installed. We're still working on some engineering issues. Uh, the Camden Street Bridge has a has more. Well, I got this backwards. Actually, the Newell Street Bridge is all concrete. There's a very small railing, uh, and the the panels for the Newell Street Street Bridge are going to be applied to the facade of the bridge. So it's when, when you're riding down the river in the riverboat or walking down the pathways. You'll look up at the Newell Street Bridge and see these kind of flowing metal forms that are uh, that are only you, you can only engage with them from the river or the river pathway. From the street level, you, you can't see them. Um, the Camden Street Bridge is the one with the existing railing that actually serves two purposes. One is it's a barrier for pedestrians and whatnot, um, but there's a sidewalk right next to it. So from a design standpoint, I wanted viewers that are you know pedestrians walking by the railing at the street level to actually see little surprises in the railing you know whether it's plants or maybe little kind of abstract little animals and in the drawing here you see plant forms and some, you know some cactus and maybe a palm leaf and but intertwined with that it's just abstract uh, movement and here you can see the overlays This is a picture of one of the panels for the Newell Bridge that's been completed. Um, each part is individually shaped and uh, kind of sculpted into what I, I want, and it's it's done on a very improvised sort of uh, approach. When I when I put the panels together, I don't really have a plan; it just sort of happens. And this is the first panel that uh, came about. These are the actual pieces that are cut in uh, from flat sheets of steel. And the forms are are generated from my sketches directly from my hand, and then cut with a uh, a laser cutter. And I've got about here the first phase of the, well, the first kind of you know stab at the project. Uh, we've got about I don't know 25,000 pounds of steel that we're trying to form up into these shapes, so that they start like these uh, kind of static flat forms. And then they're transformed into these very uh, kind of, you know, flowy, water-like, organic-like, uh, ribbony, very, in my mind, you know, I kind of, the steel becomes, it, it starts to come alive after I work with it, so. And here are some of the process. Uh, you can see it's very labor intensive. Um, not that I, you know, love sweating in 150 degree heat, but it's just, it's just what it is. That's the, the only way to get the form that um, sort of fluid and eloquent and, and elegant is uh, and poetic and whatnot is to get it to the temperature where it becomes almost like clay. Uh, and it's usually a, a pretty serious team effort to work with these pieces. And each piece has is its each little piece is actually its own little individual sculpture. It's just that the, it's, it's a giant linear collage of, of sculpted elements. So. And Anyways, when do you think it'll be complete? I think we're going to be over there when it's uh, cooling off a little bit in the fall. So. <laughs> Thank you, George. Uh, will the panelists please come up and be seated? And now we'll, we'll have a little bit of discussion. So as soon as you're all seated, uh, I have a few questions I'd like to ask, and then we'll open it up to the audience. For those of you who'd like to stay and participate, we welcome that. And whoever wants to answer, just shout it out. So um, my first question, um, particularly to those of you who have had ongoing studio practice apart from your public art, how does working in public art differ from your studio practice, and what are some of the 
the, the difficulties perhaps or challenges of making that leap, or maybe it wasn't a difficult leak, leap. Who would like to kind of address that? Martin, um, into the mic. Uh, the, the first time that I did work in a public space, um, some, you know, there are difficult things to deal with, and uh, there are um, adjust, adjustments of approach because one's entering a potentially very hostile space um, because of the weather, because of the uh, people who may want to vandalize, and the kind of those uh, financial and all the sort of difficulties that you don't necessarily have to deal with in your own studio. Um, but the long-term thing that I think is worth talking about is that there can be a great dialogue where the, there's a sort of an interchange between what one might do into a, in a public space that might vary slightly from the studio practice. You then bring elements that you've learnt in the uh, public space back into the studio, and so there ends up being quite an interesting kind of, I suppose, almost like a conceptual dialogue between the public work and the private work, and one's informing the other, and the other ends up informing the, the other. <laughs> Sorry, that didn't sound... Do you have a preference in terms of either type of work? I think it's always very gratifying to see a resolved piece of work somewhere out <laughs> in the world, um, but there's a great deal of just the kind of calm sitting around in your studio, pottering with bits of stuff in your own hands. That you can, that doesn't uh, have to go into the public unless you choose phone to. Calls yeah. And you don't have to, yeah. uh, <laughs> you don't have to organize sort of two and a half thousand tons of metal or whatever it may be. Um, you don't have to go to find special glass in Germany or, um, or do masses of research. I don't know, there's something about I quite, I've got to say, personally, I enjoy the balance. I like being out in the public realm, and I also like having the privacy of uh, quiet <laughs> studio, sort of more contemplative times. Does anyone else have something to, yes? Yeah, I feel very, is this on? Yeah, I feel very much the same, uh, that there's <clears throat> a balance. The, the ways of working are so completely different. Uh, when 